Uh, so I want to start with a question, and that is, are Rubyists good at testing because they have good tools, or do Rubyists have good tools because they're good at testing? So to, to me, it seems like this latter question is a much less plausible kind of question to ask. Um, it sort of asks the question of, like, how is a Rubyist good at testing? What, what makes a Rubyist specifically good at testing? Um, that doesn't really make sense to me to sort of ask this question. And so I, I look at this as sort of, um, <clears throat> sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, <laughs> th this is a weird question to me because Rubyists are not just Rubyists. Rubyists are, are C programmers and Java programmers and uh, Python programmers. And so when we're writing Ruby code, we're, you know, this, this question basically means we're, we're really good at testing when we're writing Ruby code. Um, but all of a sudden, when we're writing Python code, we're not, good we're not good at testing all of a sudden. So it seems more plausible, like the first question is really the, the question that is, is the correct one to ask. Like, um, do Rubyists have uh, good, are Rubyists good at testing because we have good tools? And that seems like the more logical conclusion, that we have good tools and that's what makes us good at testing. And you could look at this through history. Um, humanity has basically evolved our, our society and our civilization through the, through the improvement of tooling. Um, humans aren't really good at anything except for thinking. Uh, we have, we're weak, we're brittle, we have weak bones. The only really good thing we're, the only thing we're really good at is improving our tooling. And that's kind of what helped us evolve and become who we are today. And so um, tools are important. They are sort of what drive our civilization to improve. And us as developers, tools are sort of how we become better. Um, they help us uh, be more productive, find bugs quicker, um, be, write, you know, write better code. So the Ruby community has we have good tools. It's, it's not to say that we don't have good tools. Um, the problem is that we don't always have good tools. And so my talk is going to focus on the tools that aren't so good. I have a couple of goals in my talk. The first one is really just to introduce a different set of tools that you might not already know about. So you know, we know about testing. We know about web tools. We know about productivity tools. Uh, let, let's talk about some other tools that you might not be aware of. It's, it's really useful to sort of look out and, and see the, the rest of the uh, communities, other languages, and sort of how they do tooling. And it, it gives you perspective, and it helps you sort of understand um, how, to, how to write better tools, how to approach problems differently, and, and maybe find some things that we could be doing better in our own communities. The second goal is after we look out and we see what other people are doing, we have to find and, and actually find out which tools we're missing. So hopefully I can give some sort of problem spaces where we're sort of doing a bad job at testing. And the third, and I think this is the most important thing, this talk is really sort of a call to action to all you people here. Uh, so we can't have good tools unless someone writes them. And a lot of these good tools, a lot of the tools that we're missing are not the easy ones. If, if they were easy, we would have written them already. So I, I really want you guys to sort of get some, possibly get some ideas from the stuff that I'm going to be talking about and really think about whether or not we can do this as a community and whether we can write these tools. And hopefully, uh, maybe I'll inspire you guys to actually write some of these tools and, and help out. So my name's Lawrence Siegel. Um, I'm going to be talking about tooling. My talk title is Towards Tooling. Um, there's a little note. I, I'm going to be mentioning a lot of tool names in my talk. And um, I won't have enough room to like reference all of them. On, on, and you probably won't be able to type down the URL because it's moving fast. So just Google the tool name plus language or whatever. Um, and if you can't find it, just come at me after the talk. And I'll, I'll point you in the right direction if you can't find the, the actual tools. So let's talk about the kinds of tools that are available to, to developers. 
This is not an exhaustive list. I left out refactoring because uh, I wouldn't have enough time to talk about it. There's a lot to say there. Uh, but you could look at, so deployment and ops, uh, documentation, testing, visualization, debugging, linting, static analysis. These are all sort of areas of, of tooling that we sort of deal with every day. Deployment and ops, Rails and Ruby are great at. We are really good at that in, in the communities. We have Chef, we have Puppet. We had Capistrano back when people were editing files right on the FTP servers on production sites. So we were way ahead of the game when it comes to, develop, to deployment. Documentation, I think our tools are pretty good. Um, I think we've definitely improved. Uh, we definitely have much better doc tools out there. I, th I think we're sort of on par with the rest of the communities. Uh, as far as testing goes, we are definitely way ahead of everybody. I think RSpec, uh, Minitest, uh, Cucumber, we have literally hundreds of gems to give you better testing environments and, and, and stuff like that. So there's really nothing to talk about for those three things. We're, we're not going to be talking about those. Visualization, debugging, linting, and stack analysis are things that are spaces where I think we could be doing a better job. Uh, and so I'm going to be focusing on those four areas. So let's start with visualization. So visualization is sort of um, a big area. Um, I define visualization as sort of debugging, profiling, and all the sort of code browsing stuff that you do with your code. Everything that you're sort of visualizing about your code, I consider a visualization tool. I think that some of the most important tools you use on a daily basis are visualization tools. It's really important to know what your code is doing, and basically if you don't know what your code is doing, you, there's no way you can write good code. Imagine you had a, th a thread running inside of a sealed box. Do you know if it's dead or if it's alive? That's sort of the idea of if you can't see your code, you have no idea what it's doing. So visualization is super important to, to, having, to writing code. So I'm going to sort of go over some, I'm going to show some tools here with screenshots and stuff like that just to go over what, what other people are doing inside of the, what, is, what, what other tool languages are doing for um, when it comes to visualization. This is uh, Visual Studio's Diagnostics Hub. It's sort of their profiling thing in, in later versions of Visual Studio. You can see it's kind of, it's, it's, I think it's kind of pretty. Um, it's, very, it's, it's very granular. It gives you really good information about what each specific port component in your code is doing. It gives you CPU utilization for your scripting and your GC and your styling and your rendering and all this other stuff. It gives you uh, load, load times for all these portions of your code. It also gives you the FPS, which I think is kind of a neat thing to add. So that's one tool that kind of shows you how, what profiling could be uh, if, if we really had a good profiling tool. This is a, the Visual Studio debugger. And I think Visual Studio has always had a pretty good debugger. Um, but this is a, on the right-hand side, you'll see there's a sort of a new feature in the debugger. It actually shows you at a high level where you are in your call graph, but not just as a list of, like, here you are in your call graph and here's up, but you actually see the actual call graph in, of the methods in your code as they are at a high level of, like, as methods and objects. So you see, you know, we're in the, we're in the on navigated to method, but before we were on the on navigated from, and, and there's, there's the relationship between where we are in the code and where we could be. And so that's really useful for seeing how your, how your program is progressing through, through the stack. This is Xcode's instruments tool. I'm, I, I bet a lot of you have probably played with this at some point or another. Um, it's a basic profiling tool. It has a CPU and memory usage and stuff. The interesting thing is it has a user interface kind of view, so it shows you how your user interface is being activated over time, which I think is a pretty useful kind of addition to a profiling tool. Uh, there's nothing really special about this one, but uh, this is Visual VM. It's the sort of the profiling tool that comes packaged with Java. It's uh, distributed by Oracle, so you can grab that with the uh, JVM, and you could sort of play around, see what, what your threads are doing and what your CPU is doing, what your memory is doing and stuff. So visualization is really about discoverability. And I mentioned this before. It really is about sort of seeing what your code is doing, but it's also about kind of exploring what you didn't know about your code. Uh, 
and all, especially if you're using a new language and you're using a new library, discoverability is super important. Or if, you, if you're maintaining a code base that you don't really know very well, being able to find methods and find classes is, is super important to, um, to being able to be productive in the language. This is Eclipse. Um, this is two screenshots in Eclipse. One of them is showing you um, where a method is implemented on the various types in, in, your, in your project. So the set redraw method is implemented in all of those subclasses, and you can see all of them at, at, at once, which is kind of nice. Uh, the second one is call references, and you can see where given a given method is defined, where a given defined method is used throughout your project. And it's not just the method signature, like 2s or something. It's that specific method on that specific class, so 2s on my products class, which is actually more useful, because if you did a search and replace, you couldn't really find that accurately. So it's not just IDEs that kind of give us this, pro this kind of visualization. All the, most of the examples I showed were IDEs, and you could make the assumption that really we have to use an ID if we want this kind of functionality. But I don't think it's just IDEs that provide that functionality. And I can prove it with this. So this is two screenshots of Firebug. Firebug is kind of like the cornerstone of, of how we do web development these days. Um, nowadays, we use Chrome's Web Inspector or something. But Firebug was the original. And Firebug is not an IDE by any means, and it's really just a web inspector. But do you remember what web development was like before Firebug? And if you don't, it's probably because you blacked it out. <laughs> because web development before Firebug was horrible. And the reason why is because we had no idea what our code was doing. Firebug gave us the vis visibility to, in our code to be able to understand exactly what it's doing. And that's really what made it such a powerful tool. And wh that's why basically no browser ships without, without a web inspector these days. This is the Ember inspector. It's a Chrome extension in, in the web inspector in Chrome. And it provides some high level functionality, like you could see what your routes are doing and what your views are, are doing and what your, what's, inside of your, what's inside of your data collections. It's a pretty useful tool if you want to inspect your apps if you're running Ember apps. So I want to talk a little bit about Smalltalk, because Smalltalk is an interesting language when it comes to vis visualization. This is a screenshot of one of the original Smalltalk development environments. And the interesting thing about Smalltalk is that it was developed from the ground up to be a visual uh, language. This UI was a core fundamental piece to the actual entire language. It was always developed with the development environment in mind. The, the fact that you can browse code objects at runtime and see methods and be able to play with those methods and click widgets and play with those widgets and modify properties and debug and go in your debugger and go up and down, that was always a core fu fundamental concept of the way that the language was designed. And there's, there's a lot of power to that sort of design philosophy of, of being Having this, always having this ability to see everything you're doing. Smalltalk was inherently visual. And I think that's, if, I think it would be really helpful if we had this same design philosophy when it came to Ruby, if we had tools that, that helped us sort of go in that direction. So where do we stand with visualization inside of Ruby today? So the best example I know of is RubyMine, and that is an IDE. It's your traditional IDE that ha provides the traditional behavior that an IDE would. You do have some kind of ability to search for usages of instance variables in your projects. You do have a debugger that provides some level of detail and threads and um, CPU usage and stuff like that. Um, and there is some, you know, there's there's some basic, you know, code hinting and documentation uh, viewing and other things that you, would that you would get in a regular IDE. So this is a pretty good tool. I, I, think, this, I think RubyMine is definitely a good start. Uh, I do think it's a couple years behind where 
where the industry is today in other languages. But I think it's I think we're on a good track with RubyMine. So how is the world working it with, with Ruby in, in terms of profilers? So a while back we had this tool which I really like called Memprof. Memprof worked in one, Ruby 1.8 and sort of died off when Ruby 1.9 came out. And Memprof basically showed your memory usage in, um, in this HTML page that showed all the memory and all the heap sizes for all your objects and everything. I really like this tool and it kind of died off which kind of sucks but um, we now have this tool called perftools.rb, which provides a sort of similar thing. Uh, it doesn't generate an HTML page, but you can generate out to a, a graph is graph that shows you sort of, at least in terms of CPU, uh, where CPU time is spent, you can see sort of how, the, how your program works with CPU time and memory usage as well. If you switch over to JRuby and you decide to move your app over to JRuby, you basically get everything in the JVM, so you could take advantage of NetBeans or uh, Visual VM, which I showed before. Uh, you could take advantage of Eclipse and all of its debugging capabilities. So basically, if you, if you use the JVM, and that's not a, that's, I'm not suggesting you use the JVM, by the way. Uh, um, but if you use the JVM, then basically you are using the JVM, and you, you basically get everything there. I wouldn't recommend switching over, running your program on the JVM just to, just to profile, because that will give you a very different idea of what your program is doing on a very different uh, VM. So I wouldn't just run your, your MRI code on if you're running in production on another environment. So. so let's talk about linting. I talked about visualization for a bit. Uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about how linting works in, in, in you know, other languages. So lint is actually a program the name of a program that was developed in, in 1979 for Unix v7. It was basically a tool that would check for random common errors that you would find in C programs at the time. It, th it did things like divide by zero checks. Uh, it made sure that you had initialized variables. It did style checking, but that was sort of like a secondary thing. The, the main functionality was, was the common errors. So how do, we, how do we sort of deal with linting inside of Ruby? We have, th we have more tools than this, but these are three of the tools that we have, reek, flog, and flay. Some of the things that they do is, is basically detect code smells in your code and make sure that your code is you know, looking good and uh, looks pretty and is syntactically correct and you know, uses the conventions that the Ruby community sort of arbitrarily defined. <laughs> um, it does not, however, find common errors in your code. It sort of works on the assumption that pretty code is good code, and that if you write good-looking code, you will have working code. So there's a tool, there's a tool called, a service called Code Climate, which uh, hopefully most of you are using. Um, and it basically shows you what the you know, grade level of your code is. And this is sort of based on reek, flog, and flay out, um, metric data. The thing is that it shows you if your code is ugly, not if your code is correct. And I wanted to sort of underscore this point and prove this. So I decided to write a program that would write programs for me. And I wrote a program that wrote a very big pro Ruby program that looked perfect in terms of its conventions. And I passed it through, uh, <laughs> I passed it through um, the site and I have 130 classes in there, and it seems to think my code is awesome. Except for one thing, it doesn't do anything. In fact, this is my code. I really like the class name, it's, the module name, it's awesome. It's very depressing. Um, so, obviously, it, you know, it's, there's a very big you know, diff disconnect between good code and, and good looking code. I just want to underscore the fact that I actually think code climate is a good tool. Um, I think it's really helpful to sort of have these rules and, and, and um, to sort of have these guidelines for how you code and make sure that you're sticking to them. It does, in the end, help code, uh, quote, code quality. The important part is that you have to understand your tools. And the important part is that you have to understand that code climate is not a replacement for testing. <laughs> 
So you, you definitely have to have your tests done if you're using CodeClimb. It's not going to replace testing. It's not a linting tool for you. It's not going to lint code for you. We do have an actual linting tool in, that is called Ruby Lint. Um, it's fairly new. I think it's about six to eight months old. It's less than a year old. And um, I tried to run it on my fake code sample to see if it would give me more results, but it crashed. So um, there's obviously more work that needs to be done in terms of linting, and that sort of brings me to my point that we basically have no good linting tools in the Ruby community. Um, so we need some. We need better linting tools. How do other languages work when it comes to linting? Well, C has lint, and obviously it's been off since, since the 70s. There's been lots of versions of it. Um, in JavaScript, there's a thing called JS Hint and previously JS Lint, which was written by Douglas Crockford. Um, those things are pretty standard. There's PyLint for Python. That's fairly standard. FindBugs for Java, which a lot of people, developers use. And FXCOP for C Sharp, which is also pretty standard. All of these things are widely used in their communities. And yet, in Ruby, we, we don't really look at linting at all. We don't really try to do that. And I guess, I mean, I don't really know the answer of why we don't, but it's, it's an interesting question to ask why we don't um, value the value linting in our community. It, it's something we should think about. So we're going to go down the rabbit hole a little bit and talk about some of the um, more academic kinds of tools that you can write or that we're missing, I think, in the Ruby community. And I'm going to talk about static analysis. So static analysis is kind of like lint++. It'll do semantic checking, but it'll do it in a much better way. The problem is that static analysis is actually kind of a really big field. So when you say static analysis to someone, you're, if you're, and if you're talking to like someone who's in academia, you're, you're basically saying nothing to them. So um, I actually Googled static analysis programs in scholar.google.com, and there's over 2 million papers on this subject. That means that there's like 1.5 to 2 million researchers with different ideas on this field. There's a lot of papers. And there's different, there's different types of static analysis. And again, this list is not exhaustive. But things like defect finding, memory checking, extended stack checking, model checking, symbolic execution are all kinds of static analysis that you can be doing. Let's look at defect finding. I'm not going to look at all those, but let's look at defect finding. Um, defect finding is basically lint, except that the difference with defect finding is that it's not looking at your syntax at all. It's really just looking at your semantics. So it's not really a, a style checker at all. Fortunately, all the tools that I mentioned before, like FXCOP and FindBugs and PyLint, all have um, uh, fi bug finding behavior in them, so they all do semantic checking at some level. And so most of the tools in other languages are the same tools that you would use for style checking, and so they're sort of built in. So for Ruby, fortunately, there actually is a tool for, um, for static checking and, and bu bug finding when it comes to Rails, not regular Ruby code, but Rails code, and it's called Breakman. And this tool is sort of finds common flaws in Rails code. It finds cross-site scripting, attacks, SQL injection, mass assignment, the um, sort of most important kind of th kinds of things when it comes to security that you want to watch out for. This is a report that uh, the tool will generate. And so you can see it'll generate a mass assignment error warning and an SQL injection warning and a redirect, um, unprotected redirect warning and a bunch of other kind of format validation warnings. So this is very useful. If you're, not already, if you're not already looking at Breakman or you don't know about it, I would highly suggest looking at it and trying to run it on your code. I don't know what the sort of false positive ratio is for regular code. I ran it on a couple of projects. Um, but um, even with the false positives, I think that's, it's very useful. If it, could, if it could point out one of those things to you, I think that's pretty important. Um, so I would take a look at a tool like Breakman. And if, if you find bugs with it, I definitely would like sort of help them out. This is a project that we should probably be moving forward. There are other and sort of more static analysis kind of. So Breakman uses a lot of heuristics. There, there are some more um, kind of formal static analysis methods to, 
detect bugs in, in code. This is a paper called Static Detection of, of Security Vulnerabilities in Scripting Languages. It, it was uh, published in, uh, in Stanford. Um, and basically what they did was they took uh, PHP code. So they did this for PHP, but dynamic languages are dynamic languages. And um, they created this novel mechanism to sort of data flow and anal analyze your code through using data flow analysis and found out these sort of entry points that they can inject unsanitized data into. And they were able, the interesting part of this uh, paper, even though the tool is not published and you can't actually get the tool, um, the interesting part about this paper is that they were able to run their tool on real world code, like real world PHP code in the wild, uh, pretty big projects, and they were able to find pretty much all of the bugs that were reported, publicly reported for those versions, they were able to find all the bugs with zero false positives. So uh, implementing a tool like this, and you can look at the research paper for their, for their actual algorithm, and the algorithm isn't that complicated. Um, and if you implement it, we can actually get a really good, uh, potentially get a really good implementation of uh, static detection of security vulnerabilities. So the next thing is fuzz testing. And so fuzz testing is this concept that you have a program running that accepts user input or something, and I'm going to throw a ton of data at it, a lot of it's garbage, and I want to see if you will not crash or delete your database or something crazy. So fuzz testing has a lot of tools. I'm not going to mention them all. Um, there's tons of tools in C and Java and JS. You can sort of just uh, research fuzz test or for language X. There's also a ton of papers for fuzz testing. This is kind of a hot topic when it comes to security in, in academia. Microsoft Research published a paper called Automated White Box Fuzz Testing. Um, they implemented this tool that they eventually merged into Sage. Sage, if you don't know, Sage is something that Microsoft uses internally to verify a lot of their core kernel code and some of their other code that's core to, to Microsoft. They were able to find quite a few uh, bugs in their code using this tool. And you could read the paper and sort of, you can get an idea of what, what they did and what they found. It's kind of an interesting paper to read about fuzz testing. They use heuristics rather than just passing a bunch of preset data at it. And they were able to, you know, sort of figure out which data is more important and which data is less important to pass in. So how does the Ruby community work when it comes to fuzz testing and, and, and that kind of stuff? So we have a tool called Heckle, which I don't know if many of you used. Um, I don't know if it's exactly a pro I don't know if it's exactly a production ready tool, um, but basically Heckle looks at your code and tries to find all these weird sort of um, points in your code, like if statements and uh, greater than symbols and numbers, and it flips those every single one of those. It'll take the if and flip it to an unless. It'll take the greater than symbol and turn it into something else. It'll take the number and turn it into 15 or 20 or something, and it it's, tries to see if your tests start failing. And if they don't start failing, that means you haven't written right, the right tests. So this is kind of a useful tool. We could really use sort of a more sort of standardized fuzz testing tool. We don't, I, I looked and I found, I found one called Fuzzbert. Um, it's sort of a year old. I don't know, how, it hasn't really seen much activity. I don't know if anyone's used it here. <coughs> It looks promising, but I don't know how good it is, so I, have, I hadn't had time to research it. That's a p potential candidate. If you are interested in this field, I would start there and sort of see if, try that project out, and um, if it doesn't work, maybe contribute back, patches back to make it better. Um, it would be really cool if we had a tool that, you know, was more standardized in the community and people were using. There are, all, as I said, there are tons of papers out there, and most of them list their algorithms in the papers and most of them are not that complicated to read. Um, so I would go start looking at these papers. So let's get a little more deep uh, into the sort of theoretical side of things, and let's talk about symbolic execution. Symbolic execution is sort of a way to run your code without having specific values. So it takes your code and it runs it, but it doesn't run it with like the number five, it just runs it with some value x. And it just runs your entire code base through 
It's similar to a concept called extended stack checking, which I mentioned before. Um, extended stack checking is basically you put contracts in your code and uh, you have a theorem prover that kind of solves your program and tells you if it's uh, logically correct. The problem with extended stack checking is you need contracts everywhere and you have to put every single contract in your code. The advantage of symbolic execution is that contracts are not required. They're only there to sort of help your program along. And the, the other advantage is that it can tell you which inputs generate which output state. So after it sort of turns your program into a set of symbols, it can then pass values in and say, oh, if I pass 5 to this, I get 10 out. So think about testing, the way that we do testing. Testing is really just a matter of getting input values and output values and making sure that our program generates the right output values for the given input values. But if we had a tool that can generate our input values and our output values using heuristics and figuring out which, um, in, in specific cases, which kind of scenarios will cause our program to fail, we could generate an automatic test case generator. So this is a program that uh, basically implements power. I wouldn't recommend implementing the power function this way. It's really ugly. But I just wanted to sort of illustrate the point of having code that might be obfuscated and have a bug that's sort of in there. So this power implementation basically has this array of size 32, 32 slots, and it puts each um, value in each slot and then returns the last value in the slot. So you can imagine if I did power 2 to the 35 or 36, it would sort of overflow the buffer, overflow the array. Our symbolic execution, and it uses heuristics to determine the numbers, but you can imagine that it would pick the a couple of numbers and try these out, and it would try, let's say, 1 and 5, and it would get 1. And then it would try 2 and 8, and it would get 256. And then it would try 1 and 0, and oops, we just got an array out of bounds error. And then it tries 1 and 33, and oops, again, we just got another array out of bounds error. So it's, it's been able to determine um, two, two success cases for our tests and two failing cases for our tests. And now we could take these cases and turn them into actual test cases just by running this tool. If we wanted to fix our program, we could just sort of provide these contracts that aren't required, but we can provide these optional contracts and say, hey, uh, symbolic executor, my code is really just meant for numbers between n 0 to 32. And then, oh, it says, oh, OK, I won't test 0 or 33 anymore. And now it will say there are no failing tests. It will give us that 1 in 5, and everything works fine. So what are the tools that are out there for symbolic execution? There's a tool called CLI, which runs on LLVM. It basically uses LLVM internal representation to um, symbolically execute stuff. So anything that sort of compiles down to LLVM IR will work in CLI. There's also one called Kudzu, which is available in JavaScript, which is interesting because if, if JavaScript, a dynamic language, is able to do symbolic execution, a static kind of analysis thing. It, it seems like it's possible for us to be able to do this inside of Ruby too. And then there's Kiasan, which is used for Java and Spark. Uh, Spark is a subset of Ada, which is sort of formally verified. And so there doesn't happen to be anything for Ruby, but um, there is sort of a tool out there that doesn't really work. There's a paper called Automatic Program Verification and Test Case Generation for Ruby Programs which sort of implements a prototype of this. Um, I know it exists because I wrote the master's thesis on it, so it's my fault that it doesn't work. Um, and the, the problem here is that Ruby doesn't really have a scientific community. And I, I kind of see this as a chicken and egg problem. The reason that we don't have scientists coming to us is because whenever a scientist comes to us to say, I want to do math with Ruby, we come back to them and say, well, there are no math libraries in Ruby. Use Python. And, and Brian talked about that this morning. And um, it, it's, we, sort of have to, we sort of have to take it on ourselves to, to, to decide that we want to support these communities and start writing the tools that they need so that they can start, when they start coming to us next time, we can say, yeah, we have the tools for you. You could start doing this stuff. And then this stuff matters to them, and they start using Ruby, and now we have a scientific community inside of the Ruby community. I think that's, that's sort of how we have to approach this problem. I, I, Brian said that you should use a big boy language, and I, 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 don't, I don't know if you went to Brian's talk this morning, but he basically said if you want to do science with 
Ruby, you should be using Python. Uh, th there's, nothing sp there's nothing special about Python when it comes to scientific analysis. The only difference between Python and Ruby in, when it comes to scientific analysis is the fact that they have the tools there. We don't. The, 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 performance, the performance characteristics of Python and Ruby are pretty much the same thing. We both have a global interpreter lock. We pretty much have the same CPU kind of performance. There's really no difference beside the fact that they just happen to have the tools and we don't. So to sort of recap what, where I think we are in, in the world of tooling, we're great at a couple things. In, we're great at a lot of things. We're, we're great at writing testing tools. I think we have that on lock. We're really good at deployment tools. We have that down. We have web framework tools out the wazoo. Uh, we have Rails and whatever. Um, so we're not so good at some other things, and I think these are sort of important part points. Is we're not so good at visualization, and I think that's really important. We're not really good at linting. We don't have any standard, which is, seems odd to me. And we're not very good at static analysis, mostly because it seems like we don't care, which I think we should, because there's a lot of benefits to having static analysis. We tend to attract web developers because we have these tools for web developers. We have Rails. We have these deployment tools. So therefore, web, web developers come to us and say, hey, you have Rails and you have deployment tools. We'll use, you. We'll use Rails. But we don't seem to do that. We don't seem to have any scientists coming to us or mathematicians or engineers. And the, the fact is that the, the, the way that we're going to build these communities is to write tools for them. We, we can't just say, like, oh, scientists don't need to be here. Scientists um, don't really need to use Ruby. They can use Python. It's kind of our fault that they're not using Ruby. I, we, we, we have such few tools, and then we wonder why scientists don't use Ruby. But really, it's, it's kind of on us to write these tools for them to show up. And you know, if you have a scientist friend who, who's using Python, say, what tool are you using? And implement it, implement it in Ruby and say, hey, I have this in Ruby. Try Ruby out. And you know, we should be able to, we should be trying to build out these communities. And that will make, as we gain, as we gain more communities in our, in our language, using our language, we gain more perspective. And scientists come in to our, to our programming language, and they say, we care about performance. And then all of a sudden, we have this portion of our community that actually cares about performance. And then all of a sudden, performance matters in Ruby. And wouldn't that be awesome if performance mattered more in Ruby? I personally think that it would. So the good news is that great tool ideas are just waiting to be implemented. As I mentioned a couple times, there are literally thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of papers that are not sort of have these prototypes that don't work or have just ideas that haven't even been implemented that are just sort of waiting for someone to come along and find and implement. And if you look on scholar.google.com under your, under your favorite topic, you could find tons of these papers. I actually had a whole set of research papers I wanted to talk about, but I didn't have enough time. So um, come find me after the talk if you want titles about a specific topic. I mostly know about formal verification, but if you want to talk about something else, I can uh, maybe talk to you about it. And with that, uh, thanks. <laughs>